This is Judge Joe Brown, and we're listening to We All Be News. News Free Dixie for the 21st Century. Hello, everyone. Mm-hmm. I am Coley Leanna Liddell Lafayette Clark. And my name has quite a history. It's my mother's name. It's my mother's aunt and great aunt's name. Our great great grandmother, who brought the name to the United States, arrived here in 1848, a 15 year old slave from somewhere west or Central Africa. We're not clear where. What we're clear about is the name she gave her children. So her first daughter was Coley, born a slave. And then the granddaughter. The first granddaughter is Coley, born 1887, Simpson County, Mississippi. So what we know about the Coley, and I'm calling them Coley because Coley is a very popular totem in Central West Africa, Congo, you'll find Coley. Tribe after tribe after tribe after tribe will have a Coley. But if you look historically at Coley, you will find that Buddha's wife's daughter is Coley. And that Coley will give us the laughing God. <laughs> We love to laugh, but also Coley is a little African mouse bird that is only found in Africa. It's about the size of a tiny mouse with a long, long tail feather and a <laughs> laugh. It has been popularized by folk who study birds in a wonderful book out of South Africa called Kiki Kitaba. So Coley begins there, but Coley has a proverb. He who would cage a Coley will find himself a slave. I want to repeat that. He who would cage a Coley will find himself a slave. Now the name has so much history because in Africa, if you're in Ghana, which celebrated the blue Nate Coley on the stamp in 1962 under the Nkrumah administration, the blue named Cole, it will be anglicized spelling will be C O L Y. But for the rest of Africa, the spelling will be K O L I. For East India, which has more colders than any place on earth, it's one of the largest families on earth, generally seen as Patel family, the name will be K O L I. So you have to look for us, because we only live in Africa, only come out of Africa. Even if you find us birds elsewhere in the world, you'll then remember that India is old Africa. The cutting of the Suez Canal divided Africa into two parts. And we get what uh, the first prime minister of India, Nehru, called political geography. The Europeans and the use of political geography to confuse as they bemuse themselves. But you can never destroy a colon. You will always be on your behind. I don't care where, excuse my language, I don't care where you are in the universe. We will be there and we will be standing in our own right. Now in the U.S. the name was spelled first as C-O-L-I-E by the great aunt and the great great aunt. But then when my mother was born in 1911, following the death of the last Coley, her aunt, the C-O-L-I-E, her father and mother decided that they were not as intelligent as they were, because her father and mother, mother coming out of the indigenous tribes, father being very fast-skinned, decided that they were better, so they couldn't have the same spelling. So even though it was his sister, he decided to give my mother the spelling C-O-L-L-I-E. Now, for those of us who are educated, and obviously my grandfather and grandmother were not, we would have known that was college. But my mother would not be faced with that until she was graduating high school in 1929 when the white superintendent of school, a man with a PhD from Yale University, told her that her name was misspelled, that it was not C-O-L-L-I-E, 
It was C-O-L-I-A. And so I am C-O-L-I-A because I'm named for my mother. She needed a diploma, and to get it, she had to change the name. So she went from C-O-L-I-E, the collie dog, to C-O-L-I-A. And it remains C-O-L-I-A today. However, I will also get a snag. This name is very interesting. That laughing God is busy, busy, busy. <laughs> in 19, well, in the early, in, when I, in my seventh grade year, we were forced to bring, every student in Jackson, Mississippi, by the Jackson Board of Education, was forced to bring a birth certificate. On arrival at school in September, the day after Labor Day, um, and so I had my birth certificate, and I, on the way up the hill, I'd never seen a birth certificate. It's all fascinating to me. I decided I'd open the envelope. So I have declared to myself that I did, did what my mother said not to do, which was open the envelope. When I opened the envelope, I found a child inside with a name spelled C-O-L-E-Y on this thing called the birth certificate. And the mama's name was C-O-L-E-Y. However, note, that my daddy's name, which is surname, which is Liddell, from the Liddell Plantation, the Scott Plantation, and also a son of the Liddells, grand, grandson. Uh, his name was misspelled as well, so I thought I'd get away with forcing the city to let me keep C-O-L-I-A, but it didn't. They let me keep L the double D's in Liddell, L-I-D-D-E-L-L, -L -L, rather than the single that put, appears on what was a forged birth certificate. We know because it was obviously tracing, and my daddy didn't do any tracing. He knew how to spell his name. He knew how to write it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but they forced me to keep C-O-L-D-Y, which I was forced to keep for five long years. But then I was coming out of high school when, believe it or not, they said, what will your name be? This is the name they're going to put on my high school diploma. So I can recover my mother's name because they never had the finances to be able to go to court to get my name changed to C-O-L-I-A. So when I'm coming out of high school, she could look at the diploma and it will have her name on it, C-O-L-I-A. Now I have a daughter who is Coley the third. I'm Coley the second, obviously and a granddaughter who is Coley the fourth. My daughter, though, has decided to change her name to Colea, K-O-L-E-A, Coley, she's keeping the Coley, the misspelled Coley, but the grandbaby on the day of her birth was K-O-L-I. She has the proper spelling, and now she is Ione Lamar's Coley, the child from Mars Coley. So, Coley is a name. We love Coley. And I will someday, very soon, correct my name, correct my spelling to K-O-L-I as I go to my hidden name. I won't tell you what that is. <laughs> you wait on the surprise, but it'll be by next year. <laughs> oh, what's in the name? What's in the name? <laughs> if it's a Coley, remember, uh -huh. don't cage us, because you will become our slave. Mm. Can't keep a Coley down, huh? Ain't no way. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to keep my two down, but they keep rising up. <laughs> I also say, like, what's in a name, but also what's in a life, because you live, you have that, you continue to lead an incredible life. And I just want to know, like, you ever thought yourself, like, looking back on your life, doing the things that you've done, in terms of, like, you know, helping other people, meeting the folks you met, doing it, this is, you know. I have just considered my life my journey, mm -hmm. and I knew when I came in here very young, at seven, as a matter of fact, what my journey was to be. Mm -hmm. 1947. I was born in 1940. I don't mind telling the age, and God knows that. Ella Baker said to me once, if you have half of the wisdom that comes with your age, tell it. Mm. So I have no problem with telling the age. But I knew very young that I was an African and that I wanted to return to Africa. I figured the only way to get there was to do missionary work. <laughs> this is at seven, when I was trying to become a philosopher. I was writing little silly stuff like my brother said it was silly, so it must be silly. Life is like water in a brook, flowing through the meadows. It creeps into every stream and look, leaps up joyfully and goes on forever. My brother said, you mean the creek, girl. Not the brook, the creek. So uh, early on, I would also get 
you can wrestle, the tussle, a little bit of the sting, having my brothers, having eight brothers, four older, four younger, and one sister, and we are right between the boys. So we grew up pretty tough little girls in terms of being physically able to take care of ourselves because our brothers made sure of that. Yeah. We also grew up knowing that my father, who was really the first male feminist, I didn't say gay, he was not that, he was not opposed to that. But he was the first male feminist I met in my lifetime. When my mother thought we should do iron our brother's shirts and do the kitchen or whatever, as the other girls in the community was, my daddy said, not my daughters. So he called a meeting of his children. And eight of us was in that meeting. Of course, the two younger ones was probably not very well in understanding. But he, daddy said clearly that you don't know where you're going in this life. So therefore, everybody in the house must do the work of the house. So what I'm saying is I've gone to life as a child with parents who were well focused, who believed in Garvey, even though they were not a part of the Garvey movement. There was no Garvey movement in Hines County, though there are 48 chapters in the state of Mississippi. Mm. But what he had to say about going home was what I grew up on. I cut my teeth on that. And I believed in that. And I had the funny dreams, and we won't talk about that because you might want to take me and my mama said, keep it up, we're going to take you out to Whitfield. Whitfield was a state, pen state penitentiary called Insane Asylum. Mm. So I had to stay out of there. Uh, so early on, I fell in love with my great-grandfather and grandfather. These are the maternal great-grandfather and grandfather because they stood up against white folk. I knew what race was. Mm. And I can't reveal a lot because I'm writing now and I won't be able to tell you the Brady story and other stories. But those two men not only faced off against white folk, but one of them shot white folk mm. and lived on a normal life. He spent a year in Parchment. He was sentenced to two each time he shot a white person, but he only spent a year each time in Parchment, Mississippi, and they made him trustee the last time he was there. So be real clear that Lonnie Robinson, from whom I, whose grandmother, I get the name Coley, was a true Coley. And he did not take anything off of anyone. And I like that. He took on my father and really, for all practical purposes, raised the man that I would know as my father. My father's father was a slave, born 1852. My father, according to his count, is born 1907. According to school records, count 1905. But despite whenever he was born, his mother was born in 1869, these were people who went through the rawness of the thing called free, knowing that it was not free. Bought land at 50 cents a dollar an acre. Brought that land into the 20th century. Had children beginning, my father's mother and father, in the late 1880s, 1890s, and the 1900s, the last child born in 1910. Mm. Very difficult life for the children as well. At least four of them are dead before 1919 from TB and other related yellow fever and related diseases. But it was a struggle. These people struggled to keep their land, struggled not to work for white folks, struggled to build crops. It was not an easy journey. So I grow up with this history and this grandfather who was raised by my father because when my mother married my father, she married into this family of radical blacks. My father's people obviously pastoral, land people, preachers, educators. But my mother's people, you get a little bit of everything. Moonshine, <laughs> you get the fierce Christians, but <laughs> have no gray lines and they don't believe in gray lines. There's black and white and there's nothing in between. Do not make a mistake with them because you may not be able to tell anybody you made a mistake because she'll take you out of here for sure white or black they didn't care. Uh, right was right and wrong was wrong. So I grew up with this grandfather who and great grandfather who told my father the importance of organizing and they participated in that farm labor movement in the south. There was no farm labor movement in Hines County. My mother, my father's, my mother's father's people were from Simpson County but they moved to Hines County. 
uh, a branch of them. So Lewis Robinson brought my granddaddy, Lonnie Robinson, into Hines County out of uh, Simpson County. Mm. So when they moved into Hines County, you no, know, they had to do what Hines County folk do. And there was no farm labor movement in Hines County. So what do you do? I still don't know how they did. You know, it'd be late night hours. They'd get their guns and they would cross, walk, you had to walk. These people were not driving folk. Maybe they did some horseback riding, but probably very little in the dark. Mm. They went next door to the neighboring Kapai County, Rankin County, and organized both white and black farmers, trying to get them to understand the importance of standing up as farmers, organizing as units, and demanding pay for your work. And hoping that they could build that in Hines County, but it got to be so hard on them uh, in Hines County that we were forced to move from the rural into the urban, what was called urban. The urban was Jackson, Mississippi, the only urban center in the state of Mississippi when I was a child. Um, so at four, I'm in Jackson, out on the outskirts of Jackson, now the wealthiest area of Jackson called Foundren Hill uh, on Mays Lake. This is where we would begin the Jackson journey. But with these people who believed that you had to fight for what you get in this world, that yes, you could own your land, and they own land just like my mother's people, my father's people own land, but owning land was not enough. You had to fight for some basic rights that were bigger than that, not wait for white folk to give you anything, don't make any deals with them, do it yourself. And if you got to hold down and with the show now, you do that yourself as well. So I grew up with this. I mean, it was just in my blood. It was the way I grew up. I didn't grow up to be violent because my parents were not violent. But I did grow up with the understanding that we had to take a stand. So by 1955, uh, when Emmett Till is destroyed, lynched uh, August the 30th, of 55, I am red hot. In March of that year, March the 2nd of that year, a young girl down in Montgomery had taken a stand on a bus named Claudette Colvin, who lives right here in New York, by the way. Mm. She's up here in the Bronx. Mm. But Claudette had taken a stand, sat on the bus. You know, that just kind of awakened something in the spirit of young folk. And my spirit was on fire. So I was ready to organize the South when Emmett Till was killed. But I wasn't going to be organizing around nothing called nonviolence. had not heard of it, didn't know what it was about. I believe then and now that you got to use whatever strategies and tactics that are available to you, uh, but choose them strategically. Mm -hmm. Strategically. Never shoot at an elephant with a BB gun. <laughs> that ain't wise. That elephant will trample you. Uh, then, of course, by the end of 55, Rosa Parks will take a seat after a young girl that Montgomery, a second young girl, Mary Louise Smith in October will take a seat. You know, it's interesting. It takes nine months to have a baby. Mm -hmm. And the two critical months, obviously the seventh month and the ninth month, and obviously the first month, because you got to begin. So Claudette Coburn is the first month. Mm -hmm. Nine months later, Rosa Parks will have a baby, but not without a crisis in the seventh month. So if we look straight through, You'll see these two young women who were in Rosa Parks Youth Council, by the way. She was not their direct uh, uh, advisor to the council, but she was there in an in advisory capacity. And so you'll see these two young girls. They will both be whipped mercilessly, mercilessly really, by the locals. Claudette Colvin was not pregnant when she took a seat on that bus. However, she will be pregnant by summer. Mm. And Mary Louise, they didn't even consider her pregnant. They went after her father, said that he was a drunk. Well, as it turns out, Mary Louise's father was a typical deacon in the Baptist church, very much committed to his work. Mary Louise, unlike Claudette, was actually run out of Montgomery. Her sister brought her here a couple of years later. She's here, right here in New York, practically enough. Uh, she's connected to 1199C and will work for them. But tragically enough, that child that was born, that first child around which the crisis came and everybody labeled her, you know, as the teenage pregnant woman who did everything on the block, uh, that child will die from AIDS right here in New York City. Really a very tragic tale. Now that second child will become an accountant, was doing quite well last I heard. Uh, I hope he's still with us in, um, in Atlanta, Georgia. I had a lot of meetings with his wife. Uh, and talk with them extensively by phone. When we took Claudette back to Montgomery in 1990, Coley Clark and her graduate student, Nancy Dawson, who is now Dr. Nancy Dawson, we took Claudette home. 
So I'm just going through this to get you to see that not only do I get the flavor, when I find a moment in history, I will stop and deal with that flavor. And Claudette Colvin was part of the, of the initiation for me into the civil rights struggle. By 57, I'm founding a black, I well, know black wasn't the word we use, a Negro history club <laughs> for girls in North Jackson. And it went on for a year and a half. I, my mother just made it into a party because she did never had this lifestyle and now she's got these two pretty young daughters. At least the other folks say we were pretty because we didn't deal with pretty. Uh, and so she's got these two young daughters and the oldest one is always creating something, whether it's poetry and writing and philosophy. Uh, you never know where you're going to go with this one. And the other one will box it out, duke it out with the police one day even. <laughs> so she didn't well. care. Uh, just tough. Uh, but they better not hear the bat. We don't play that. Uh, but when I founded the club, my mother would, you know, have party stuff rather than the books that we were founded to do. I wanted us to begin reading. We didn't have any books. There was no library for black youth. When we went to school, that's where we found the few books that we had in our textbooks, which were usually leftovers from white folk. But I loved books. My sister loved books. My brothers loved books. My mother loved books. My daddy had three years of education, and only three. Spent most of his time, folk, this is the Bible, and he'd be struggling with that Bible. But my daddy was the best contractor you will ever meet. Now come back to that part. So what happens is, is that on this journey of 57, I've abandoned, with 58, I abandoned my, 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 my Negro history club for women, for girls. And I prepare myself for high school. And I will enter high school in 59 at Tougaloo, where I'll be among the founders of the Tougaloo chapter of NACP, college chapter, the first college chapter in the state. And we will work from there down to 61, March of 61, when the first demonstration will be pulled off. I'm not one of the Tougaloo Nine. We're supposed to be about more than nine. But I had to see Dr. Siddiqui, Mr. Siddiqui's class in biology, and I was having a very difficult time in college right now, so I went to take my exam. Now, let me back up a little bit, because I know we have to talk about these two parents. My father, obviously raised by a former slave and a woman who was born um, really technically four years after slavery, but still born in slavery. Uh, when I back up and I look at this side of the family, I am looking at a family uh, which now the DNA clearly says a Hebrew. That's our DNA. That's not my DNA. <laughs> we haven't done mama's DNA. Whatever her DNA is, my DNA. But that's daddy's people's actual DNA. But they were very Arabic. They spoke a lot of Arabic language. My father included, and I am positive my daddy was connected to the Ethiopian war on the side of Haile Selassie. Haile Selassie was like a god for him. If he saw him anywhere, my daddy would do, be throwing those Masonic, even if it was a pitcher, he'd be throwing those Masonic signs. But when Selassie came into Jamaica one year to visit Jamaica, daddy sat in front of the TV, closed the door. The last I remember is he had something that looked like that going with the Masonic signs, his eyes in the TV. The only other time he did something like that was when black men were boxing. My daddy loved the box. He'd be boxing with him. Get him, Joe. <laughs> Knocking him out. Get him, Ray, whoever. <laughs> uh, but my daddy's people, I said, were very pastoral, but very committed to child rearing. The kind of issues that would arise in my mother's family at times did not arise in my father's family. I am the first divorce in the history of the family. The first divorce. My brother, the second divorce. But we were the two July children two years apart. So my mother concluded there was something wrong with you lie. <laughs> but these people were strategic though. My daddy made a living. Three years of education, but he made a living. He was registered to vote in Mississippi, Hines County in the 40s with only what? Three years of education, but he passed the exam. He was my daddy. But beginning in 44 when I was four, Right on Miss World War II, my father decided that we needed to start going to the Mississippi Delta. So we made contracts with Delta Planter, and we would go from the, to the Mississippi Delta from 44 to 50 when at last somebody tried to conscript us 
Meaning, you take a big cotton pick, pick, picking family and you force them to remain on your plantation. Ad infinitum. My daddy wasn't having it. His Masonic brothers did not respond. My daddy was a 33rd degree Mason. And he thought that they would respond. He learned a lesson. No, they did not respond. They did not come to his aid. What came to his aid was a white woman with 10 children. Poverty, poverty, poverty. They picked cotton in the same cotton fields that we picked cotton in. We watched her be mistreated by the woman uh, who was the owner, along with her husband, of the plantation. We sat through that noontime, the total disrespect and violence to this sister. But when it came time for the need for a little arms and a truck to get us out of the Mississippi Delta, it is this white woman's children, her sons, her two oldest sons, that will take us out, and we will have our, my, my brother and my daddy will be armed to the teeth, and they are armed to the teeth, and had only one promise that we would hit, daddy would help that white child find a job. He did, he did quite well. Oh, uh, because he was white, he did a lot better than he did. <laughs> Let's be real clear about that. But daddy then took a real cotton picking family to the Delta. And I have to talk about that, because if you don't understand hill Negroes, and I'm being nice, and bottom Negroes, then you don't know Mississippi. People who lived in the hills, meaning the Jackson area, after you leave the lower foothills of the Mississippi Delta, which is Yazoo City, Mississippi, that's where the Delta begins, and you head into Jackson, you're heading into the hills. You're actually going uphill. But the hills are not mountainous hills as we'll see around here if we look down here across these hills where we're sitting today here in, in Sugar Hill <laughs> in New York City. Uh, but we would pick the cotton. The people who planted and cultivated the cotton were the bottom Negroes. They lived in the Delta land where for miles you can see no trees. These are the people who did the hard work of raising this cotton, who will be lucky if they get 50 to a dollar, a hundred, lucky, lucky if you get two dollars, a hundred, to pick the cotton, even if you are able to stay in your own house to pick the cotton. So when we would come to the Delta, somebody was moving out of their house. I understood that when I was growing, I was talking with my mother, and I said, how could we do that? I just didn't understand. And she said, well, we had to make a living. So when we moved up, we even were at Belzoni in the first really nice little house. And the first time I ever saw an electric light, that was 1947. Mm. Uh, in the Delta, we had lamps and candles. We didn't have running water until we got out of the place where I was born in an old slave house called the old Dura Place, a little bitty house, the second house, uh, the old Coca Place, uh, all in Hines County. So you can just see this growing up. We didn't have that. We were just poor folk making a living because my parents were good at it. But when we went to the Delta, we found another life that was paved streets at Belzone. We had rock roads, red rock roads, in my North Jackson where I lived. So now we're in the Delta, where we also will meet a level of violence as we bring this big cotton picking family that's gonna pick 200 minimal a day and my daddy and one brother is going to pick 300 a day or more, never less. And two brothers are going to pick bale of cotton and my mother's going to pick a bale of cotton a day. Just natural born cotton pickers. My mother has a great grandmother named Mary who's actually in the history books. The first history book of the state of Mississippi uh, looks at the Parson Plantation and this great grandmother is there. Grandmother Mary, she always picked 500 a day. The bale is 500. So you get these big cotton pickers, and that's why they wanted us, because we also pick clean cotton. We also are what's called clean people. Mm. My brothers are not hanging out. When the day is done, it's done. You come home. You get a rest. My daddy would let them go oftentimes up to the little so-called township, but he didn't like it. So he'd trail behind them. Let them get up there, then he'd take, hit the trail right behind them. <laughs> because they had slot machines to take the people's money as soon as you made it. So these flatland and this, this hill and flat land, a uh, bottom land, Negroes, are uh, schemed on by these planters. 
right on the little township, you'll find a little juke joint, the little black juke joint. And sitting right in the center there somewhere will be a slot machine. So you got the nickel slot machine, you got the white folk food and everything else that's being sold, and really, for all practical purposes, white ownership of these small places. And they could be very violent. But we're in the Delta, we're a cotton picking family. My parents will make more money in the first two days of picking cotton in the Delta as a family. Then we would make come they would make combined working in Jackson. My daddy working at all kinds of work, sawmills, uh, uh, cement factory, and his big job became working for the power company, which he kept for 42 years. Uh, but then after that, my daddy also went to wood yards, paint houses, do whatever you could because you've got a big family. You got 10 children. You cannot live off of these this, this minimum wage. My mother would work. She never worked as a maid. Never worked for any white folk mm. in their private setting. She worked for a laundry, dry cleaners, and as what she would proudly say, "I am an experienced wool and linen presser." So making money. Mm. My daddy had to figure that out. He was a great contractor. Once we went to the Delta, and the White planter actually moved his daughter and son-in-law out of the new house they had built. It didn't have any running water or plumbing in it. But he moved them out and moved us in. That's how important it was to them to make sure that they got market value on their cotton. And they, he planted cotton right up to the doorsteps of the houses. But I wanted to come back because we have to talk about what happens to this bottom Negro mm -hmm. when the Hill Negro shows. There's a, oftentimes an arrogance of part of the Hill Negro. Mm. We are more important. After all, if I'm moving you out of your house, I must be more important, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, but the other part of it is those who would not move. In 1947, when I was seven, we moved right at the confluence. That is where the Sunflower River begins. We're right at the confluence of that river. It would be the most tragic year of my life in the Delta. So I could now understand what I didn't understand in 44 when a little girl was hit in the head with a monkey wrench, a nine-month-old little girl, because she cried too much. She was dying from pneumonia anyway. But here we was in 47, playing in the dust with the children from up the road, a woman who had refused to move out of her house. She would not move out and let those blacks from the hills move in because she planted around her house a really lovely garden. She had a little space there. And this was the food that they lived off across the summer, would live off across the summer, and had for most of the summer. But now you want to can also what's left and try to dry what you can so you'll have food for the fall and winter season. Mm. Wow. But it was not to happen. Because one morning around two, I always say around two, my mother said she didn't know, but it was early in the morning. She just had a dream, and she jumped from her dream, screaming, Eugene, get your gun. That's my daddy, Eugene. So my daddy and my brothers was up, gun and bats and whatever else they could find, running through the night. And all I remember are the flames. We were too far away. But the five children we played with were burned up with their mother in the house. As far as I'm concerned, my Delta years were over, though we would have another three. It was very difficult. And this is how many of family went, especially women, <coughs> with children who were trying to struggle to keep their children alive, didn't have somewhere else to go to live with somebody else, didn't want to leave the little gardens that they had planted, if you had space to plant it, because most planters would plant right up to the steps and around the house, every lick of cotton that they could get a row on, a, 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 a space they could get a row on for the cotton. Mm. But we picked up, and then we returned to the city where we were in the colored schools. I went to a Rosenwald school, many of them. <coughs> a branch of one Rosenwald school in North Jackson. The area where I worked was a Cottage Grove subdivision, the most popular area there is Verdon's Edition. We are the next edition up. Mm. And this was the area where most slaves lived. They were free. So this is the free area where most freedmen lived in the state of Mississippi. There's only 555 free blacks 
in the state of Mississippi doing slavery. Mm. And most will live in this area. <laughs> Leading up to the mud line. The mud line meaning where the gravel road left off and the blacks who wanted large acres of land would be beyond that mud line. Mm. This is the area where we grew up. And so here in this area of Jackson, in the Rosenwald schools that I didn't know until about five years ago were Rosenwald schools, we just knew them as colored schools, or Negro schools. My first school was called New Hope. New Hope is where I got my baptism in education. First time I began to understand that there was a distinct difference between blacks who had a little bit and blacks who had nothing at all. My mother would dress me all up because I was turning six, I just turned six that summer, and she wanted her pretty little long hair gal to really be sharp, so she dressed me up, put all those pretty ribbons on my hair. Mm -hmm. And because her hair is a mixture of this mixed curl that many blacks have in the South, and I have the mixed curl, you'll find it popularly all over Africa, but certainly in East Africa. Uh, because I had that, folk thought I was a black Indian because we also had this strange accent. That's that mixture of that Arabic and whatever my mother spoke well, with her indigenous and African and Europeans all coming out of Hines County area where we had lots of Arabs, uh, Palestinians, we even have Palestine Road. Jordanians, we have Jordan Road, not because of the Bible, but you ain't gonna find no Israel Road. You can forget that. But because of that, when we went to school, people thought us kind of strange. We didn't think we looked like them, didn't think we talked like them and they would take my ribbons. They told me, I'd, well, where your mismatched socks? Meaning that my socks were always the same. They even took my socks. But when they tried to take my underwear, my mother told my brother he had to teach me how to fight. <laughs> 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 so he beat them up one day, and the next day when they put the hand, he used to mob me. The next day when they came for me, I, I was ready. Because <laughs> it was either that or face my brother, and they were gonna be bouncing me off the wall. Mm. Uh, but I went here. And we got a fairly decent basic education in those early years. So my first nine years of schooling was fairly decent. My high school years, even though I loved it, and it was a great socialization, was the poorest education possible. I wrote not one essay for high school. Not one was ever required. Yeah. This is the high school where Lerone Bennett went to, mm -hmm. the first black on Wall Street went to, yeah. and where uh, Richard Wright would spend about two months, the great writers. So <laughs> this is my high school, linear, junior, senior high school. I love it with a passion to this hour. That's after going through uh, the Rosenwald schools and then getting a new school, which was political, 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 to build a new black school in North Jackson, mm -hmm. of all places, out here in the countryside, and the additions, uh, rather than downtown, uh, where the Old Lanier was the first Lanier High School, and where the old um, other elementary school was. So rather than build there, they built in North Jackson. We had uh, a, a, a rocking chair governor who rocked us to sleep, and one way of doing it to avoid desegregation was to build a popularized new black school. It had everything that the average white school had in it, except uh, we got new books, but we didn't. We had labs and with no test tubes. <laughs> we didn't even have a Brunson burner. Uh, we had um, art studios. Nothing for an artist was in it. Not even a paintbrush. So we had all those things and some very decent teachers. Here I would get my first um, male teacher. He was dynamic. A Mr. Nelson who had been a part of the old uh, Youth Communist Youth League. Of course we didn't know that because communists were evil people and nobody talked about communists. You didn't want to face Senator James O. Eastland who headed up the House on american Activities Committee, our senator, and you certainly did not want to face uh, the brother that preceded him, Joe McCarthy. The red baiting, the red scare that spread all across the South and stopped a lot of black organizing. So I grew up in that. Pretty much is where I started. I'm gonna let this brother ask me some questions. I just want to give you some background. Uh, my parents believed in education. They focused on education, and they gave us what they could. And the Rosenwald School was my beginning. I don't have that kind of a mind. She also had a scientific mind, very mathematical, you know, calculus and whatever else. 
Uh, the, my daddy built his own homes from scratch, our first two houses in Jackson. Mm -hmm. The last one now is a historic monument uh, for the state of Mississippi for the civil rights movement. Uh, but my daddy built that from scratch on his own. The man with three years of education was a master mason. And they kept all that Africa had. You built your own houses. Mm -hmm. And my daddy not only built them, but he did the piping for the water. He did the piping for the gas line, despite his struggle with the city of Jackson. They would just come out and pay him for what the work he did. And he did the electricity, which wasn't the best I might add. We had some electrical problems at points. Right. But my daddy did that on his own. Fought with the state. My mother drew the blueprints for these houses. They just couldn't believe they had these two people. So she drew the blueprints, and the city of Jackson told her that she couldn't have two bathrooms. Mm. That her hallways were too long. Mm -hmm. That the size of her bedrooms were too big. Wow. So she had to scale back. Uh, they felt they had to scale back. And so in five years, they finished the house, and we moved in there. So I celebrated my seventh grade year in the new house. Mm. With a new name. <laughs> that's, wow, that's, that's amazing. So I mean, like, so he, was your father functionally illiterate then? Was he? Could he read at all? Not really. Mm -hmm. But he could draw contracts. Anything. My father's a true African. Wow. Contract law was his. He was a major in contract law, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and Jesse yeah. Jackson, who was, I never yeah. forget, was doing the Jake Meredith March when I understood how. Because I didn't consider my daddy bright. Because he wasn't like, like my mother, you know, mm -hmm. all educated and stuff. My mm -hmm. mother was going to have, you know, the high school education. Right. But that was educated. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Jesse was uh, making a parallel between Dr. King and the great Moses of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And he said that Dr. King was Moses. So my daddy listened to him. He said, well, I don't know that I agree with that son. <laughs> well, he's Moses. He's going to lead us to freedom. So well, daddy said, let me tell you something, boy. After Jesse talked, because daddy would just listen, mm -hmm. which is true of black men in the South. They don't talk. In my generation, to talk now. <laughs> but when I was growing up here, they just sit and listen. They listen for hours sometimes before mm -hmm. they say a few words. But they're measured. Mm -hmm. And my daddy is, I have so many proverbs from father. But we'll come back to the proverbs. Because this is the best proverb he ever had. <laughs> mm -hmm. He said to Jesse, he said, son, let me tell you something. He says, it's true that Moses got the children of, of Israel out into the desert. And they stayed out there 40 years. Mm. And they still be out there. Except there was a man named Joshua that came along. He took uh, Moses to the top of the mountain, pushed him over, came back and beat their asses out. <laughs> Excuse the language, folks. Uh, I laughed my head off because I, I got up now because I would always sneak around wherever the men were. I would sit <laughs> and listen. But after that statement, Jesse was so embarrassed. Everybody in the room, a little white boy was sitting on the floor. It was so funny. People were like, whoa. <laughs> that the only way Dr. King could become Moses mm -hmm. is if he was prepared. My mother loved Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. And she only knew him, the boy, she hear in the paper every now and then somebody talking about because they, they didn't read any other literature. Mm -hmm. um, but she liked the fact that he was like her father. He mm -hmm. believed in a strong self-defense. And a strong self-defense is a fight-back defense. Right. You hit me, I hit you back. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, my daddy, to hear him take that kind of a strong stand, which you never hear, would hear him say, you know, he hung out with my grandfather, her father. Mm -hmm. Uh, was to me brand new. So I got up and left and went on back in the back room because now I could be free. Because dad had set the record straight. <laughs> uh, and that's where we were. So we, you know, I got this strong family. And, um, and I appreciate those two old folks. Mm -hmm. My mother would work with you to make sure you paid your taxes cause, so you wouldn't lose your land because my parents both believed in land. Mm -hmm. She would threaten you if you didn't pay your taxes. Say, can I help you? And we didn't have any money. Hmm. But they were going to figure it out. I remember once a lesson from her, and I do want to show you how strong she was. We were out in the yard playing, and a woman had moved in next door, which was rare in my neighborhood, to a woman without a husband. Mm -hmm. These were, people bought the small little, the little lots, and you built your houses on it. I had them built on it. And you lived as family. The whole community was a community. We played together as community. Um, we all had the same get-up times, the same break times. We had a hill where we, you know, where we, was our recreation here where we played ball and did ring games and sometimes the boys would even join in the girls' ring games or the, mm -hmm. would, all would let the girls play their ball games and sometimes the girls would be the best, uh, but that was rare. Uh, but, mm -hmm. you know, this was a community. Somebody needed something, especially older women. Our feet were running. 
we were at service of the elderly. Wow. And, and you just did it. And if they gave you a nickel, which they you better hide it, and not let your mama know that you ever received it, or your tail was going to be wrong. <laughs> well, this day, this family that moved in next door, the woman had five children. She had a little maid's job, which she, I guess, had on and off. No husband, really struggling just to stay alive. I'm mm -hmm. talking now about staying alive. Mm -hmm. And a lot, she was very pretty. So other women in the community, you know, were saying, like, you know, she's going to have to get up out of here. And they did find her around the house. But I'll never forget this day. The children was, were playing in the backyard. The younger children had an older brother who was, um, he found a little job, I don't know if he was caddying or found, was working in the yard for somebody, some white person. But he wouldn't be there, he would work. And he was a young boy, about 14 years old. Mm. And one of the younger boys was out playing, and another one went in the house and he screamed out, Mama, Mama, can I have the biscuit under the mattress? <laughs> And oh, we started laughing, laughing. <laughs> All I knew is that I was being pulled up by the back of my dress. My eyes were popping and just snatched it. There stood my mother, who was about five feet eight, five feet nine. Mm. I'm the only short thing in the family. Everybody's <laughs> six feet over. Uh -huh. So here, I, but my sister's also about five eight. Mm. It was not believable. She made us come in the house. She began to collect the food and make us take every bit of the food, the flour, the meal, even the salt and the pepper. We took it next door. Mm -hmm. And we had us before she got it there. She said, Miss So-and-so, said, come out. She said, you know I got too much stuff over here and I just want to know if you want some of it. So mm. she said, oh, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. I said, mama was starving, her children were starving. But we learned a profound lesson that day. She said, if I ever see you laughing at anybody, you're going to have to deal with me. Mm. And I'm going to make you cut every am switch. My mother was really from that Congo clan. Right. And they didn't believe in breaking even a leaf off of the tree. And if you broke a, a limb off of it, mm. you better be prepared to plant five trees. And she meant every word of it. So my daddy would sometimes sit and graft it, mm -hmm. show us how to graft the trees so we could grow the trees, so we could plant them. Um, you know, here she was saying to us that, you know, you don't know where you're going in life. Like my daddy was saying, but in another way. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. that you will not do that. Right. That we share what we've got, but you are never to laugh at anyone else. Oh. That's unacceptable. Mm. It's unacceptable to laugh at Gorgeous George, which was our other lesson. Gorgeous George was a homosexual man that lived across the creek. Mm -hmm. He always had some dogs, and he was very lively and very colorful, and I must admit he was very colorful. So Gorgeous George, George was coming up the street, he was a very fast-skinned man, he was saying, Oh, it's a gorgeous day, and hello, it's gorgeous trees, and gorgeous this, and gorgeous that. And as children, you know, we would be, yes, sir, Mr. Gorgeous George, and laughing. And my mother heard us. Oh, buddy, we got our tails whipped that day. Mm -hmm. But she also made a real clear picture. Mm -hmm. We were clear about her picture, that I want you to see this snapshot. You are never able to laugh at any adult. Mr. George, and he's Mr. George to you, Mm. Mr. George is a man. Mm -hmm. So it was a lesson learned. And when my daddy came home, he really affirmed that lesson. That mm. I heard you, I was laughing at Mr. George. What's wrong with you? Mm. You're my children, you don't laugh at anybody. Mm. It's an adult and you respect him. So we would say, hello, Mr. George. He knew something had happened. Mm -hmm. And so he would stop and say, well, hello there. You know, <laughs> we would just, as kids, you know, we'd behold her till he got down the street. Uh -huh. But we couldn't say anything because we knew mama was watching. And we knew our tails were going to be raw because she would put that M switch on your tail. Mm. And my mama, I don't know, if we were said when we were grown, if there had been such thing as child abuse laws when we were growing up, uh -huh. my mama and daddy wouldn't have been allowed to die. They would still be in Parchment Penitentiary. Oh, oh. <laughs> but they raised eight boys and eight girls without the hassle of cops. We went through schools, we went about our business, and grew up to be strong men and women as a result of their firm upbringing. And it was firm. Take oh. it from me. Oh, excellent. I also want to ask you a little bit. I'll be remiss because I had visit uh, Charles Evers a couple weeks ago. I, I know you got a, you know, you was a secretary. You worked closely with Megan Evers, his brother. Yeah, I wasn't his secretary. I was his uh, special assistant. Special assistant. Yes. Excuse me. I'm sorry about yes. that. Special assistant. I just want to get your thoughts about Megan Evers. Uh, what type of person was he? Oh, Medgar Evers, uh, I always called him the, the black Harriet Tubman, male version of a Harriet Tubman. But he was more than that. Mm -hmm. Medgar was a tier level organizer. 
Yeah, no respect for class. And we really, not most of us people growing up in Jackson had no respect for class because we all lived in the same communities. Mm -hmm. Though some of us might have been college professors, a doctor here or there, a lawyer here or there, we were all struggling, we all worked together, we shared what we had. So class wasn't as much of an issue. There was class, but it wasn't a clear distinction. Maggie did not care about class. Maggie would work with a maid, he'd work with a yard man, he would work with people who came from the underside of life. Mm -hmm. He visited the nightclubs. He'd hang out with them at the Masonic Hall, at the Elks. Mm -hmm. He would do that because he worked with everybody. And I didn't understand until years later when I was looking at the movement in Jackson, Mississippi, and I was just looking at that in Jackson, that we organized the state of Mississippi. For, we had 82 counties. And for those counties that had a reasonable population of blacks, there was a black NAACP president, a mm -hmm. black chapter. Some of those were organized by the brother that preceded him, Dr. Howard, who worked out in Mount Bayou, where Mega started his work at Mount mm -hmm. Bayou, Mississippi, all black town, set up by Isaiah Montgomery, who had been the bookkeeper, slave bookkeeper, to Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. So everybody was there. Mount Bayou had the largest cotton gin in the state of Mississippi in the 1880s. It was a very popular black town. I had a cousin who was, in fact, mayor there. Mm -hmm. uh, and the family is still there. Uh, but the thing that is the, the, about Medgar that you have to understand is by organizing at that level, he brought the strategic style of the man that he emulated, Jomo Kenyatta, mm -hmm. to the table. That was his style. Mm -hmm. Now, unlike Jomo Kenyatta, he was not running around. Tom might have had some mouth mouths, which was probably not real since Jomo did not organize the Mau Mau. Mecca didn't know that. Mau Mau was organized by Dadon Kamante, who was killed by the British. In the same way that Subukwe will be killed by the British in South Africa. After starting the, after the, the kickoff of the war in South Africa in 1960, after Sharpsville, which was organized by the Pan-African Congress of Azania, not by the, 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 the ANC, the African National Congress. So you have to understand the differences here. Mm -hmm. So Subukwe was put in a little house in the same way in which they put Dedan Kamati years earlier, a little house right outside of the prison, you know, on the same grounds. And of course he will, uh, that is Dedan Kamati, and he will be killed there. Mm -hmm. And you know, 50, 60, or thereabout, 61 or thereabout, Subukwe will face the same fate. So Medgar had that style of not being loud and talking about how bad you are and what you're going to do. But I can guarantee you that the night that he was set up on in a black community, and I find it very difficult to this hour to, to anybody tell me that a white man was hiding in some bushes in a black community, waiting to waylay Medgar mm -hmm. without somebody in the community not knowing he was there. Mm -hmm. We could smell a white man from 100 miles off when he come in our communities. Mm -hmm been through many of an experience of waking up at night and we knew that some white person was on the block somewhere in the community. And every black in the, in the community would wake up and usually turn on a light, not the porch light, you usually turn on the light in the house. Mm. And stepped away from the light because you didn't want to get shot through a window. So Medgar was that kind of a person. Medgar would go on to plantations and bring people off using the Harriet Tubman style. That is, Medgar would drive by, but I remember driving in the car with him, especially in Canton, Mississippi, where he had a really nice uh, NSP branch. You would drive in, drive into the little town. All of a sudden, the lights would go out. He'd turn his lights out, and you'd go down the block, and you'd watch the porch lights come on, and you'd watch them go back out. Then he's going to back up or sometimes turn around and come back. Mm -hmm. Because you cannot let that black, and numbers of blacks, a constant reporters to white folks. You can't let them know that you are there to do some business. So you try to come in late at night when people are asleep. You cruise in, you don't come in with noise. And you turn the lights they, you know, light off and then you're gonna meet in the room in the dark. Mm -hmm. You're gonna hold your discussion. Sometimes people are able to block out the light and you get a little light. But that was the Medgar Evers that I knew. Medgar Evers went on a plantation down in Philadelphia, Mississippi where the three boys were destroyed. Mm -hmm. to get a woman out. This would be right outside. It's not in, obviously not in the little town. Mm -hmm. But the woman had 10 children, 
And she had written Medgar, and Megham had this huge plan to go. And i never forget him. He was in this snow white shirt that Murder Lee had ironed. She was a great ironer. It was mm -hmm. ironed down. He had on his coveralls, and they were ironed down with a crease down the center. And I was saying to myself, I don't know how you think white folk gonna know he ain't the same blessing. <laughs> <laughs> ain't nobody walk around dressed like that. <laughs> but he did go by bus. But when he got there, somebody was waiting with a truck to get this woman and her 10 children out. So he said when he came to the plantation, he made this noise. He had a little noise, he did a little yuck, to let him know. Because you know, you didn't just come on a plantation. And you can't go through the gate. You got to figure out where the dogs, that is the white man's Negroes who are watching the fence, are at a given time so you can get across that fence. Because mm. you got to get in. So he got in. He went to see this woman. She would not leave. He had a truck waiting. But she wanted him to bring the truck in to pick up her Frigidaire. Mm. What? Uh, oh, no, she wanted to take a new Frigidaire. Some son in Chicago had brought her a Frigidaire. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't leaving with that. He said, lady, you got 10 children. We don't want, we don't have room. Oh, we'll make room. We'll be in. She's showing him how to make room. He said, no, we, don't, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. And so she wouldn't leave. He came back, and I'll never forget, he was sitting in his office the next day crying. He actually just broke into tears. He said, I just don't, as he told us the story, I just don't believe this. She wouldn't leave. Mm -hmm. To show his compassion for his wife and children, one evening he got a call from some man. He was always getting called. The call, all of this 24 7, whites would be called the president of his life. Mm -hmm. But this white man was telling him, don't kill him. And Megan said, well, come on down to the Masonic Temple. We were housed in the Masonic Temple. And the Masons have not been given their credit for housing the civil rights movements, mm -hmm. especially. Uh, in Mississippi, Macomb, Mississippi, where the revolution will begin. We're housed there with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And we're housed in Jackson, the NH Peace House in the Masonic Temple, mm -hmm. which is now a historic landmark. And mm -hmm. it's being re re rebuilt and renovated. But Medgar actually went in the office and I forget, he was screaming and crying. He said, just come, please. He wouldn't come, he wouldn't curse. Please, I beg you, come. Like Mayor Daly? <laughs> I wouldn't need to campaign. <laughs> Five? Uh-huh. Whole nation? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he was mucho serious. Oh yeah, I know he was. Mm, you wouldn't need to campaign. Well, actually, it's like, you know, I want to get to the back to the story, but like Lyndon B. Johnson, his his portrayal in the movie Semo, or like the recent stuff that's coming up about him in terms of his legacy, you know about his involvement maybe in other things that might have affected the history in, in a negative way. What's your take on Lyndon B. Johnson? Well, let me just say this. I mean, Lyndon Johnson was a Southern mm -hmm. politician, probably mm -hmm. the America's only politician in the last 40 years, except for Bill Clinton, who's also very much a politician. Right. Uh, Obama's a politician. Mm -hmm. But they were politicians. Mm -hmm. And you cannot use a school teacher, former school teacher who's now a politician, in the South outside of his actual living legacy. Mm. But he did some things that were quite unusual. I don't remember whether the riot was in Oregon or Nevada. There had been a black riot. One, one city one week and one the next. Mm. Well, anyway, he was in town and asked him about the riot. Mm -hmm. And he said, I just want to say <laughs> that if I was a Negro, I would riot. <laughs> this is coming out of the mouth of a president of the United States of America. Wow. Then he went on to say in his speech, and the chicken come home to roost, and we shall overcome. So he, he was paying attention. <laughs> he was not. He was figuring out how do you use mm -hmm. a political tool. We have a political tool, whether we want to accept ourselves right. as a political tool. We've been mm -hmm. political tools since we came here. Right. We came here as what? Slaves. Oh. As, 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 as prisoners of war, right. who, mm -hmm. prisoners of war, who were forced into a, that local enslaved slave system created by the whites who colonized the land. So we're an African colony. Mm -hmm. We're colonized people. We brought in this colony, this cross-Atlantic colony, mm -hmm. brought into the Western world. So you'll get like cross-land colonies in mm -hmm. the USA, you get them in Russia. Russia's a cross-land, all cross-land, to build their empires. Mm -hmm. But the USA is what cross-land, killing up the natives, and the people that we call Mexican who are the natives right. and others in Central and South America. Mm -hmm. Then you look at the goal of the nation, according to George Washington, the Congress of, speaking to the Congress of 1787, mm -hmm. before the uh, Constitution, mm -hmm. 
coming into it. So that would be before the Articles of, under the Articles of Confederation. I'm speaking of that, Congress, about the, the coming nation, mm -hmm. the coming republic, excuse me. Mm -hmm. And so what will be the goal? Okay. The goal will be to destroy the wolf with the Navy, moving cross land to the west coast mm. and from that south. Mm. This will be a European empire. Now if that's the goal coming out the mouth of his first president under the Constitution, right. the Article of Confederation, those men were a little different. Mm -hmm. Their ideology is sometimes vastly different. Mm -hmm. But it is very clear that when you hear of the doctor who, I'm trying to remember his name, uh, he was out of Massachusetts, who believed that blacks could not feel pain, one mm -hmm. of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, walk up, you cut your darn arm off. <laughs> Some of the first theories, uh, scientific theories about blacks, is that we could not feel pain. So we didn't feel pain. George Washington left a young 19-year-old boy at Valley Forge 19-year-old boy standing out there holding his horse. The boy froze. Mm. And the argument is, you see these little statuettes all over the place, mm. people have front in their front yard, that it started with that little boy. Wow. Standing out there, little black boy, nine mm. years old. Did he give a damn that that child had no clothes? So it was 1909, it was nine or 19. No, no, this is a George Washington at Valley Forge. Uh -huh, but the, the, the fighting boy, with the British. He was nine years old? The child was nine years of age. Wow froze to death. Mm -hmm. And there's a, some kind of a little mention of him there in, in D.C. at one of those monuments. But this is history of George Washington. Mm -hmm. I just want to take that, that instance. Now, George Washington made that statement, and then there was commentary on it, coming from Jefferson, who said, well, you know, it's kind of hard, but I believe in it. Coming from Adams, yeah, I'm really hard, and I think in the long run, mm -hmm. it's going to work against us. Mm -hmm. But I, I go along with it. So when you looked at the whites who would become the leadership for the nation, this new nation under the under leadership of the republic, the so-called democratic republic, and we know that's a lie mm -hmm. because it's a slave republic, mm -hmm. can't be a democracy and have slavery. Those two are inconsistent. And you can't be a democracy and deny white males the right to vote in this hour. Mm -hmm. White males won't get the right to vote till 1831, 1832, mm -hmm. all right? just 30 plus years before black males get the right to vote. They don't understand that because of the brainwashing is so, they forget that their indentitures could be extended at any minute to mm -hmm. a permanent indentiture. Mm -hmm. As it was for a black sister in 1645, she's the first permanent indentiture that we know of in the courts in Virginia. Mm -hmm. Not only did they give her a permanent indentiture, which means forever she would be indentured, working for the slave owner, even though we want to call him an owner, he's a slave owner, yeah. prior to the encoderment of slavery, or the codification of slavery, all right? Mm -hmm. So not only that, but any baby she had would be a part of the, her permanent indenture. Sure, can you imagine? Same thing applied to whites. And many of them got the same hard stroke of the hand. Mm -hmm. But when you were getting ready to end slavery, you had to create white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Now, there was already racism, so we need to be real clear about that. Racism was a fact, matter of fact. Mm -hmm. If whites and blacks ran away together, the black always got the worst end of the stick. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. Whites would be severely punished, but they didn't get, you know, death or this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you get a permanent indenture, he didn't have to die. Black man got the permanent thing. Mm -hmm. So that is very clear, but what is not clear to folk is that you need white supremacy in order to end slavery because you're freeing four million people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are four million of us. That's right. You don't free four million people with Mississippi uh, blacks out in number and whites three to one. Mm -hmm. In most states, they were about equal to whites. Mm -hmm. But in Mississippi, outnumbered them three to one. You gonna mm -hmm. free that? <laughs> so we need to stop being children. Right. We have to become grown folk, y'all. Grown folk. Mm -hmm. Grown folk think like grown folk. That's what's happening in World War II. 900,000 black men coming home. You do immediately what? You said, oh, you don't have to pay the poll tax if you're a soldier, a black soldier. Mm -hmm. You don't have to pay the poll tax. By 48, say, oh no, we're going to desegregate the military. You're damn well right. Mm -hmm. Because you got 900,000 trained men coming home. Mm -hmm. And we will see a bit of that at Columbia, Tennessee. When those men are assaulted, those men fight back. 
And it's the beginning of the historic civil rights movement. Oh. Columbia, Tennessee, 1948. Oh. So we need to look at these things and begin to understand from a human perspective, but look at it as men and women, not little boys and girls. This thing is not designed for our freedom. You are not free if you have no clothes, no shoes, no hat, no nothing, no land, <coughs> no way of taking care of yourself or your family. How in the hell are you gonna call yourself free? That's not freedom. That is a release for you to be a now free to care for yourself. That is the little penance of food that they provided you the inadequate housing that you were provided, you now provide for yourself. But where? Because this is day one. You got to go back to the plantation. Now we should salute probably 20 to 30 percent of blacks like my great grandmother, the Kohler clan. She said clearly she beat that white woman half to death with her damn with washing board. Because the woman had her beat and really crippled her for life. So Katie B, and she would always be as a verb, it's her verb, Katie B, Katie B this, Katie B that. So Katie B left that plantation after she whipped her behind and she said, I never look back, mm -hmm. never look back. But that is not most black folk. Mm -hmm. You'll have people going off just like Katie B to look for families. But Katie B was looking for a life, mm -hmm. looking for a life. So what I want to say, let's grow up. We were not free and before the eyes of a condemning world, Mm -hmm. We reinvented ourselves Africans, representing more than 2,000 different African cultural and ethnic and racial groups. We invented ourselves an African people. Not only did we invent ourselves an African people, we took on the wrong family style as far as I'm concerned. We had no business emulating a European lifestyle, but we were trying to follow that Christian tradition, trying to be accepted by him because we had what? We had nothing. We had nothing but the clothes what little there was, the rags on our back, oftentimes toes missing on our feet because that was one way to keep us from running away. So we had nothing. Mm. And out of that nothingness, within that first 10 years, Mississippi had an architectural engineering firm. Mississippi had, and I'm just taking Mississippi, which was among the poorest of the states, despite the fact we'd been the wealthiest of the state of the cotton states. We were long staple cotton. But New York got 40 cents on every dollar. Another story. But despite that, we'll see these people schools built at the Rust College at, um, at Mount Bayou, Mississippi, where Ida B. Wells and Barnett will come out. Uh, sister that says, I will not give my life lightly. Mm. She will go on to lead a movement for the first boycotts. Ida B. Wells will lead a struggle against lynching. Ida B. Wells will also lead a struggle for quality education, and obviously a struggle to build journalism for black folk in this country, uh, as Iola, Lee, Iola Leroy, under her pseudonym. So we see this people with nothing. We get newsletters with nothing. We get savings and loan institutions with nothing. We buy into the Freedmen's Bureau, Freedmen's Bank, and lose everything. And to this day, the country not only has not apologized, we're talking about reparations? They need to give us back the money invested in the Freedmen's Bank that went busted and we got nothing because white folks put it in their pockets and walked on. We need to begin to deal realistically with who we are, where we are as grown men and grown women. Mm -hmm. We have to remember that we came here, what? As African prisoners of war, not slaves. African prisoners of war. We might have built this land, but we built it with ropes across our backs and on our necks, on chains and on our ankles and feet. We were forced to do what we do, did here. Once we begin to recognize that, we will begin to wake up as Malcolm was waking up, as Kwame Toure, Stokely car maker, Michael woke up and understood that he was an African man. We have got to understand that. Garvey woke up. Wake up. Even if you want to stay here, wake up knowing that you didn't come here to kill up the native and take what he had. We're talking about the murder of 45 million people. We didn't do that. The Buffalo soldiers trying to prove that they were men and could fight like white men. Obviously, we could fight like white men. We fought in every damn war we had up to, up to the Civil War mm -hmm. and through it. But we did not go around killing up our native brothers. In fact, we married with them. You look at about a third of the black nation, you'll find out we come out of indigenous tribes and African tribes. And the rest of it was rape. Pure rape. We 
are African people with an African culture, African traditions. So what we did immediately after slavery, they had outlawed the drum. We did what? Mm. That drum started to beat, boom, 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 boom. Kadum, kadum, tell me how did you feel when you come out the wilderness? Tell me how did you feel when you come out the wilderness? Leaning on the Lord, well, I felt like shouting. You know, we did this with the drum. We brought back the tambourine, all those things that worked like drums. No longer did we have to use our throat. Boom, boom. <laughs> okay, we're back. I know, uh people interrupt you but I want to get back to that about the mega yeah but I want to I'm, I'm coming there because mm -hmm. what I'm saying is we have to become critical thinkers we have to stop being liars mm -hmm. we have to confess that we are scared mm -hmm. and we should be scared because we're living with an animal that will kill everything including his own mm -hmm. proven <laughs> to kill everything including his own mm -hmm. all right mm -hmm. no question about it mm -hmm. has proven to kill everything including mm -hmm. his mama daddy whatever he has to kill to get what he wants. This is an animal that loves land. He left Europe, which had very little land. We looked at Europe on a real map. Mm -hmm. We look at it on the globe, you don't find any Europe. You find a small piece of land mm -hmm. that has been used up, but he took that land from Europa's children. Europa's children are black. Europa is a black woman. If you look at the icons in Europe, you will find black icons. So yes, we have to become critical thinkers, but we have to be strategic and wise because we are dealing with killers. Mm -hmm. Now, Medgar Evers was a critical thinker. So, locating your office in a Masonic temple mm -hmm. with men who are brothers of like mind, mm -hmm. men who have set up the base for struggle in the South, men who will probably have been a part, and I'm not labeling them, mm -hmm. because the Underground Railroad did not die with slavery. Medgar and others were using that underground trail always to get blacks out of the South when they needed to be gotten out. When I was born, 1940, there was a sister who two weeks before my birth had an incident with a sheriff uh, at Crystal Springs, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. this, is the, this, is, this is the myth or the legend. She is said to, when he knocked her down, have come up with a piece of bottle and cut his eye out. I gave him a good cut in the eye. She had a baby, a little boy. Mm -hmm. My mother kept that baby for two long weeks. All she knows is there was a knock on the door in the night mm -hmm. and told, she was told that she was selected because they knew she was having a baby. Mm -hmm. So I shared, I was born <laughs> at the time he was there. I shared my breath with that little boy. Mm -hmm. And then they just came in the night and they took him away. Mm -hmm. My mother never met this sister, but they told mother when they left, she's safe. Mm. And these are black men, mm. all right? This is how well these trails were organized. So Medgar is working with NACP leadership, men and women, mm -hmm. across the state of Mississippi in most of the 82 counties, mm -hmm. organizing these branches of critical thinkers. Mm -hmm. But he is faced with a serious issue. His house, his car, mm -hmm. his insurance, mm -hmm. his salary is owned by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People that he works for. Mm -hmm. And they don't always see eye to eye. All right? So you got a critical thinker who has work to do who oftentimes runs into big issues with his presidents of chapters mm -hmm. who are not satisfied. With what's happening, they don't understand, and I didn't understand, that's why I left Medgar mm -hmm. and went to Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, that the man has to feed his children and take care of his family. This is a man who is a critical thinker, who understands that he is a local organizer. He's not gonna go off to Georgia, not going to Arkansas, he's gonna be in the state of Mississippi. So he says to me, when I question him, mm -hmm. you know, why are we having mass civil disobedience? Why are we going that route? He said, let's study nonviolence. We did study nonviolence. Mm -hmm. But he said to me, you know, that my salary, my insurance, my house, you got to understand, I got to take care of the family, don't go. Mm -hmm. But I was going, because I thought he was being too bold and aggressive too, right. by now. Mm -hmm. Medgar was critical thinking, he understood the importance of young women. Mm -hmm. So he'd bring us into the movements, and all of us got bad reputations back. Mm -hmm. People thought we were sleeping with him. We weren't sleeping with Medgar. Mm -hmm. 
Mega never laid his hand on me. Mm -hmm. Had he laid his hand on me, he had a laid his hand on him. <laughs> uh, so, you know, my dad had problems with that. His uh -huh. wife had problems with that. I don't want to say it or not, but she did. Yeah. But the problem is that he didn't do that. He yeah. understood that he needed to build female organizers in the same way he needed to build woman organizers. And often if you got the female, you got the man. Mm -hmm. Snick understood if you got the man, you got the woman. Did it work both ways? Uh -huh. All right, but Mega understood that, so he spent quality time telling his secretary, Lillian Lewis, to make sure that I learned how to handle logistics, mm -hmm. that I learned everything about office, anything that was to be in that office, I was to learn mm -hmm. every machine in there. She was the finest mind as a secretary I've ever seen in my life. She was truly competent to the point where he knew that he could depend on her for every need he had. And he did. Mm -hmm. And she was always a step ahead of him. Mm -hmm. Because what? She studied her role and she taught me what I l learned about the office, about how to house people, how to find transportation for folk coming in for all these conferences that we had in the state of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. He was a critical thinker. Mm -hmm. He was a critical thinker. Not only was he a local organizer, but he was a political organizer and an economic organizer. Mm -hmm. He organized at every level. So he didn't mind working with maids, uh, folk who were at the lowest strata of the workforce. Mm -hmm. But he also understood that segregation had moved us out of the main economic pool. Mm -hmm. That we were substrata of the economy. And the only way we were going to break down segregation mm -hmm. was to figure out a way to go after the main sector of the economy. So he started a boycott. It's the most successful boycott in the South, not Montgomery, Jackson, Mississippi, where he will lay down his life. Downtown Jackson, where you were not allowed to try on clothes, mm. where blacks, if they had a job down there, all was, all was some mediocre whatever. Mm -hmm. This day, it has never reopened and never will. Because of what? That powerful boycott mm. that removed black uh, economy from downtown, so we didn't go down there for anything, but also because it was so hot down there all the time. <laughs> and I thank my young brother for that, Louis Liddell, mm -hmm. who would be the band director for Jackson State, actually organized more than 500 young men, and it is they who make that boy's cart successful by doing things which we would think unthinkable. Mm -hmm. Catch you downtown, cut your hair off. Mm -hmm. Catch you downtown, take your bags. And before your face, give them to somebody else. The boycotts in the community, which augmented the downtown boycott. Catch you at the store you weren't supposed to be in. You get to your house, they meet you on your step and take your groceries. And before your face, give it to your neighbors. Now, that may sound hard, but that is what needed to be done. So you saying it's okay to have a goon squad? Right Whatever you need. <laughs> Vietnam is the best example uh -huh. of war that I know. Mm -hmm. The Buddhist monks are burning themselves. Other folks are demonstrating in the street. Cab drivers on boycotts in South Vietnam as a movement is coming in from North Vietnam. You got to understand that to live this life, you have got to be a warrior. It's never been an hour when you weren't a warrior. You come in here to fight. Every animal fights in this world. That doesn't mean that you shoot people, cut people, especially they don't kill each other. But you've got to understand that critical thinkers will be looking strategically. Medgar's role model was Joe Mo Kenyatta. He named his son Kenyatta. As I said, he didn't fully understand what Kenyatta actually did, but what they said he did, I it. he read every single word of it, had his mouth in it, his eyes in it, his teeth in it. He understood that and figuring out ways to organize a state the most oppressed state in the Union because at one point it had been the most organized black state in the Union. Wow. Mississippi, that gave us our first two black United States senators. Mississippi, that will give us one of the congressmen that will go to the Congress and give us public education. Mm. J.R. Lynch out of Mississippi fighting with the brother out of South Carolina, together organizing white senators and congressmen will give us public education for the United States of America. Mississippi, where we had the first black lieutenant governor in, this, in the country. Mississippi, where we would have mayors going out of mayors by the bucket loads. 
where we'll have sheriffs and county supervisors where the money is controlled with the sheriff and the county supervisors. Mississippi will do that. Mm -hmm. Today, because Bob Moses came in, working with Medgar and James Bevel and others, in, and David Denson Corps, and others in the state of Mississippi, will be the most organized state during the civil rights struggle. And as a result of that, Mississippi has more than twice of the elected officials of every state in the United States combined. That is black elected officials. And it's still among the poor states. I want you to understand that. Most people don't understand that. But critical thinkers understand that. Bob Moses is a critical thinker. James Bevel was a critical thinker. We have to begin to look at David Dennis as a critical thinker. Mm -hmm. Coming together with Medgar Evers, a critical thinker, and a ton of NACP presidents. Mm -hmm and other NACP people who were critical thinkers. Mm. That the organizing piece is critical because when you leave, if you got to leave, you leave something behind. Right. You don't leave Selma behind falling apart. Mm -hmm. You don't do that. They did it at Jackson because they killed Medgar and took the body away. And so the African tradition of organizing around the body, mm -hmm. around the warrior, elder, sage tradition, mm -hmm. out of which we come, mm -hmm. Kennedy took suck the energy out of that. And Jackson today looks like Selma. So it's if terrible condition. Buried, buried down there, it would be different. Right? Oh no, he'd be home. And the fight would have continued. Jackson movement fell apart. Oh. It fell apart at his death. I mean, it just, it had to fall apart. I like this about Megger. Was it true that he kept, I know he was a World War II veteran. Was it true that he kept guns in his car and stuff like that? He had one gun in his car, 38, in his glove compartment at all times. Mm -hmm. And the night that he died in a community where you will never convince me, right. never that a black man can, a white man can lay out there in the bush and ambush him without black folk, uh, more than one, at least one, knowing where that he was out there. Right. The night that he was killed, my mother pulled me from the bed early in the morning, we we'll both say around midnight hour, there, shortly thereafter. Uh, she got me out of the bed and she said that me, the woman just called and said, Mega Elvis is dead. And I was getting up in the days, I was kind of angry with her, I was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And I thought she was just messing with me because she didn't like me to go to demonstration stuff because I was married. <laughs> right. <laughs> so she figured I got beaten pregnant in Birmingham uh -huh. uh, in May and I'd come back to Tukalu to go to school. It also gave me, you know, to get my body back together. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't know I was pregnant when I got a beating. Mm -hmm. uh, so she, I just figured she was messing. And she'd had to run in with Diane and I, cussing us about being out, calling us names. <laughs> <laughs> Coming here at 2 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, you know, I ain't going to tell you the name she called Diane and I. So, <laughs> I was like, okay, mom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I get up in a daze and I come, started into the hall from my bedroom. Mm -hmm. The bedroom my sister and I shared in the house built by my father. Mm -hmm. uh, as I came into the little hallway there, uh, the short hallway, to get ready to go down the long hallway to her in my daddy's room, I heard on my brother, had an old short red radio. And apparently my father had instructed my brother when he got the news to try to get the thing working. And my brother, Louis Liddell, who was leading that campaign in Jackson, who would replace me as, uh, I founded the North Jackson NHP Youth Council mm -hmm. in order to, let me say that, because of the NHP piece. To so tell this, you have to know the other piece. Mm -hmm. We've had a chapter on the campus that had a major demonstration at the local library. And that was an NHP uh, sit-in that was a test case, not a, a not a, civil disobedience piece. So after that demonstration, I was embarrassed, you know, that I'm in Jackson and somebody has to leave the college campus to come to my town where I live to demonstrate? I don't think so. Mm. So I founded the North Jackson NHP Youth Council, which would later, you know, be get honors and all that stuff, uh, but also will become the base for Megas movement. Mm. Uh, but anyway, so I'm coming down that hallway and my little brother who would replace me as the president of that council, and little brother is about six feet now. He turned out to be six feet four, but he's about six feet now. So he wasn't, he wasn't little brother anymore. Uh -huh. um, I could hear, Mega Evers, Mega Evers, Daddy, Mississippi. And it was Radio Japan. Wow. And he'd gotten it on the shortwave radio. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't believe it. I was in the days, I walked down the hallway. And as I got to my mother's room, because that's where the phone that I was going to use rather than going up to the living room, I had a phone in the living room and a phone in her bedroom. Uh, the phone rang again. So I said, Mother, I get it. And I got it, and there was a woman, a black woman was on that phone. Mm -hmm. And she had a very nasty, Medgar Evers is dead. Then she hung it up. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why me, 
I don't know why the anger, mm -hmm. but I have never been talked to by the FBI. Mm -hmm. Mega Special Assistant was never asked a single question, which told me that there was more to his death than a white man laid out in some bushes. Mm -hmm. That will prove to be, and Medgar had that 40, that 35, 38 in his car, had he, in that glove compartment, had he dreamed that white man was in that, he dreamed it. Mm -hmm. He'd have lift that field, that field up, mm -hmm. that spot where he was supposed to be laying out there at, at Woodrow Wilson, which was a major Highway 80 piece through there. So, that same evening, my first husband, Bernard Lafayette Jr., mm -hmm. who I left in Selma, mm -hmm. that we went into being an organizer, and I'm not gonna talk about Selma today, right. but in this context, I have to mention Bernard. Mm -hmm. We went in there February of 63. Mm -hmm. They began an organizer, I've got a sneeze, <coughs> something out here that, I'm, that, that my system says it's supposed to. Excuse me, people, I'm sorry. <laughs> right. We're out in the park, and there's something in this park that my system, uh, is reacting to, I've got an allergy here. Mm -hmm. So, Bernard was informed by the FBI because he was hit in the head at, at Selma the same hour that Medgar was hit in Jackson. Oh. He was informed by the FBI that was to be two, three killings. Medgar and Jackson, Bernard at Selma, and another brother whose name I always forget, people get, get tired of me saying, but I just can't remember his name, mm -hmm. over at New Orleans, Louisiana. Okay. That brother was not struck. But Medgar and Bernard were down. Bernard appears on the front page of the New York Times, and I wouldn't know it till the day following the Sunday, following the funeral. The funeral was on the Saturday. Then my own husband, well, I just, we didn't have a phone at Selma, and I just figured he couldn't get to a phone or couldn't you know, confine anybody to give him a phone to call his wife about what was happening in Jackson. Didn't come up for the funeral. I just figured, and I didn't realize he'd been knocked down too. So he, was he actually shot or was he like? No, he was hit in the head, in the head. Okay. with the butt of a gun. Oh, wow. Saved by Max Shannon, who lived above us, who was a sharpshooter from the Korean War. Wow. <laughs> Max didn't play. Mm -hmm. And everybody in the community, including the white folk at Selma, knew Max didn't play. And when Max hood, he broke on that front porch shooting. Mm -hmm. And so the four men that had hit Bernard got out of there. The FBI said that they were supposed to not hit him at all, but to capture him and bring him four blocks into the white community where he was to be lynched, the white mob was waiting. Jeez, so this was like multi-state, so this- Multi-three states. Why did the government even get involved? That's a violation, right? You cross state lines, that's a conspiracy, right? Why didn't the federal, I mean, I'm gonna ask some shit. Why didn't the federal government intervene and, and, and do something about this? Why didn't they, they immediately yeah. intervene and, and Stop start making. a major investigation into the murder of Medgar Wiley Evers? That Sunday I'm talking about when I find out my husband has been knocked down with John mm -hmm. Doerr, who is now going himself, the mm -hmm. chief attorney general, deputy attorney general who mm -hmm. was in the state. Um, that Sunday, at, at, at following Medgar's funeral, he says to uh, us when Timothy Jenkins, who was a law student out of Yale, mm -hmm. a very powerful young black man, brilliant man, Mm -hmm. You know, ask you know the question when he when he said to us he couldn't that the government couldn't intervene. Timothy began to really query him legally, mm -hmm. and John Doerr said, "Well, you can stop right there." He said, "Because this administration and any administration runs on policy, not law." Mm. So it was a policy of the Kennedy administration to choose not to investigate. And to say, well, it had nothing to do with voting rights. It did have to do with, no, it had to do with y'all having demonstration. I don't know, hell no. Mm -hmm. So the argument was we were engaged in, in, in the civil disobedience demonstrations downtown, so he died as a result of being engaged in the civil disobedience and trip. You divide the man out from his work. Mm -hmm. So you get this part of his work. Mm -hmm. And you take him away from the key part of his work, which was also part of registration and voter education work, and had been for years. Well, it's just like, to know this type of information, why are a lot of black people so still in love and infatuated with the Kennedy, with the Kennedy family, the Kennedy administration? This is like, you just told me, you know, they didn't want to intervene, they didn't want to help with the movement. And we talk about, like, oh, Bobby Kennedy having died, uh, Dr. King wiretapped and stuff like that. Why do you think black folks are still in love, or well, some black folks, not all black people? Well, I think, you know, we have to deal with the nigga demons factor. Mm -hmm. Raise me up a nation. Raise me up a nation that will obey. We all sing it. Mm -hmm. That the nigger demons approach, and we learned that in slavery. Because mm -hmm. we had who was our preacher? Mm. 
who was our preacher? Our preacher were white preachers. Right. We sat in white churches. We were indoctrinated into Christianity after 1815. Before then, there was no heavy indoctrination in the South because when you became a Christian, you could also leave slavery. Mm -hmm. It was one of the elements for, you know, for leaving slavery. Mm -hmm. So after 1815, because now you got the new slavery, mm -hmm. and we need to be real clear about the phases of slavery. Mm -hmm. There's the British sector of slavery, which is the first sector. Mm -hmm. Then there's the second sector, and it's broken down into two parts, because you can get rice kingdoms and all, all kinds of stuff, depending on which economic crop you have, whether it's sugar cane, tobacco, cotton. Mm -hmm. uh, cotton is what? King. Cotton becomes king right. after 1808, when we were supposed to be freed from slavery. Instead, there's what? Then increased important, in, in, we've been brought in in larger numbers. Mm -hmm. They try to argue that there was uh, an increase of, uh, of, of, of uh, continental slavery. So in other words, they increased our numbers on the ground, but that's a lie. My people came in, my daddy's folk came in 1828, 1836, 1842, and 18, 42, and my mama's last one was 1848. Her earliest one was 1805. So we have to look at that. Mm -hmm. This is when the thing was supposed to have ended. Mm -hmm. 20 years, 1808 was supposed to be over. But it wasn't over. One, we had the cotton gin. Mm -hmm. But the cotton gin in itself is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. If you don't have major warehousing, shipping, mm -hmm. and if you don't have some other little pieces that connects to the cotton gin in order to do what? In order to be able to break the cotton down, right. de-seed it and stuff, you do that with the gin. Mm -hmm. But the next piece is how you're going to develop the threads. And those things were not developed in America. Those things were invented in Europe, in England. Mm -hmm. So we get the invention of that in England and also Amsterdam. And now you can develop short staple cotton, which was most American cotton. That long staple cotton out of Mississippi was the same cotton as that on the Nile, the same cotton as that in India. That's long staple. That's a long thread. If you ever pick cotton, don't think about cotton. Mm -hmm. You know the difference between that fluffy long thread and you can just pull it look like for hours stretching it. And that short one that goes whoop, mm -hmm. <laughs> you go zoop, and it's broken. Mm -hmm. So that long staple cotton was not what was marketed. What's ma the major market is in short staple cotton. Britain has gone through what? An industrial revolution that now has a middle class. Mm -hmm. And that middle class can buy the cotton. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the War of 1812, with them coming back in here, they didn't come back in here just because they wanted to, to get back at the boys for losing the first round. They were back in here for totally economic reasons, and one of them is to try to get control of the cotton market. So Mississippi becomes the first cotton state what year? 1817. Mm. Do not be fooled. Wake up, folk. We've got to study war. We've got to know who we are. We've got to become critical thinkers. We have to be strategic in our actions. We have to raise our children that way. As I was raised as a child and others raised as a child, that we become parts of major movements. It's because of the way in which we were raised to be critical thinkers, to look at a full picture. 1817, Mississippi becomes the first cotton state. Alabama won't come until 1823. So you got these cotton states coming in across the South. And even with that, the Mississippi Delta is not developed until after the Civil War. The Arkansas Delta, the Southeast coming in from the Carolinas will develop that Arkansas area around Pine Bluff, Dumas, Arkansas. That was not a part of the old slavery in Mississippi. French slavery was there, the Natchez territory that Napoleon didn't sell to us until what? 1803, when he sells the Mississippi territory to do what? To try to finance the behind beating he was taking in from the Haitians. And they beat him good. Haiti destroyed the most powerful military on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. They destroyed Napoleon's army and ran them out of there. And he had to fall on back into Europe to do his war. So, so in order to try to finance that, he sold the Mississippi Territory. And then Andrew Jackson will come through that territory with his no good, oh, he's the most evil man that ever lived. Mm. And he will come through and Jackson will lose the name Lafleur's Bluff and become Jackson, Mississippi, the mm. capital of the state of Mississippi eventually. Wow. So let us look at these things. Let us become critical thinkers. Let us join Meg Evers as a critical thinker. Let us understand you cannot 
have a movement without social, political, and economic strategies. Mm -hmm. They are blend together at points and sometimes you see them very separate. Medgar understood that. He understood he was a tier level organizer and a tier level leader. He was a leader for all of the people of the state of Mississippi. He was willing to bend and give in, even when he was instructed by his national office not to work with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Jackson Nonviolent Movement, not to work with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. He had good common sense, qualitative common sense, and he was willing to give in and join with these young people who made strong arguments. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, go ahead. I want to ask about Mega Evans. I think it's interesting because when we think about the great leaders from that era, we think about Malcolm and Martin, and a lot of people think about their rhetorical, oratorical skills. How great of a speaker was Mega? Was he a great speaker at all? Mega Evans was not a powerful speaker of the type of a Malcolm, Malcolm X or Martin King. Mm -hmm. These men were trained in religion. Mm. Mega's training was in politics. Martin will grow. We'll get a chance to see Martin's politics mm -hmm. before they get him out of here. And we'll get a chance to see Malcolm's evolution, his politics, before they get him out of here. Mm. But once you become political, you got to go. Mm. You got to go. You cannot stay. Kwame Ture, who I'm sure they murdered him. Mm -hmm. Once he became political, he had to get out of here. 500 years from now, when we look back on this great era of history, we call it the Civil Rights Era. Mm. That's the first wing of the Civil Rights Era. Mm -hmm. Not this wing that I'm so proud of now, when young people are taking control of the leadership of a nation after 50 long years. Mm. It's the proudest moment of, oh, when I saw them beginning with Ferguson out, I never cried so, mm -hmm. because I saw them taking leadership. Mm -hmm. I saw them needing to have Bella Baker's words that the movement is bigger than the hamburger, the movement is bigger than mm. the criminal justice system. Mm. That they had to become critical thinkers. They were great organizers, the greatest organizers I've seen, and mobilizers. But they have got to do more than mobilization. They have got to become fine organizers. The movement is much bigger than a hamburger. And the hamburger that we're dealing with is the criminal justice system. Medgar Evers understood that. Meg Evers got heavily involved with the youth from the outside, was willing to build a youth base at Jackson, Mississippi, and let the others have Macomb and the rest of the state. Mm -hmm. But he also invited everybody into that movement. He did not have a movement where this is the NAACP. Right. Mega did not do that. Mm -hmm. Mega understood that it takes a whole people to build a village. We have to make ourselves whole. If we're going to raise strong children, we have to make ourselves whole. Medgar Wiley Evers, a fine man, a wonderful husband and, and father, a great organizer, a great leader, was a local leader, none finer. And moms maybe always saluted the three of them. Mm. Medgar, Malcolm, and Martin. She would say, you know, where have all the great men gone? Mm -hmm. You know, what happened to them? And she would always call them out by name, Medgar, Malcolm, and Martin. We have Medgar Evers College here in the state of New York, right over here in Brooklyn, and we must develop that college. We must connect it directly to every southern black college there is. We've got to do that. Mm -hmm. The HBCs have got to be connected to Medgar Evers College. His college, Alcorn, mm -hmm. where he got his bachelor's degree, has to be connected to Medgar Evers College, Tougaloo College, the Oasis of the South, right. the headquarters for the Civil Rights Movement, mm -hmm. has got to be hooked to Medgar Evers College. Mississippi Valley State, Jackson State, which now houses most of the major centers of the Civil Rights Movement, have got to be connected to Medgar Evers College along with the Selmas, the Albany Georgias, uh, the Fort Augustine, Florida people, where the Dr. King left to come to Selma, not Albany, Georgia, that they talk about in that line film. Mm -hmm. But it's Fort Augustine, Florida, where they took a good beating, mm -hmm. lost their fundraising base, and needed to take Selma. But that's all right, too, mm -hmm. because it was a good moment. And even though SNCC gets kicked around, SNCC will be here. Kwame Ture will be here 500 years from now, mm -hmm. when history really begins. Mm. Why? I'm sorry Medgar missed it, because as Medgar had believed as he believed, Medgar believed firmly in Africa. 
and I need to not just look at Africa and emulate Africa, but possibly at some moment go home. But he believed in Kwame Ture, so deeply in Africa that we needed to Africanize ourselves, not just scream black power, mm -hmm. but to practice it. Mm -hmm. So Kwame's words on a Mississippi road, black power, followed by Dr. King's affirmation that black is beautiful and it is beautiful to be black. Wow. That young man on the Mississippi road, Willie Ricks, who said he was the first to come up with, we know that both Du Bois and, and Richard Wright used the term, Richard Wright in talking about black nationalism in 1948, in a little essay, talks about black power. Mm. But the power of those words were not just words. We, you call me black, before 1966, and I've always been the black child in the family, <laughs> you had a fight on your hand. Mm -hmm. If you call anybody black, I ain't black. <laughs> but after 1966, we were not only black and proud of it, as James Brown said, I'm saying loud, and I'm black and I'm proud. We became black. What did we really become? Mm. We reclaimed our human selves, our humanity our African selves. The only way we can be human beings is to fight the struggle to take away that which was taken away with us with the gun and mass violence. We're removing us from our environment, our environments all across Africa to slaves, prisoners of war who fought in bloody wars against our capturers, our colonizers. And I'm really pleased that when I look at Baltimore, and I see the struggle that young people are trying to waste there. And I have to smile to myself and say, most people don't know that this is the home of Frederick Douglass. That this is the home of the man who said, you know, he who must be free must strike the first blow. Mm. But I really smile when I say to myself, this is the home of Henry Highland Garnett, mm. the father of black nationalism. Mm -hmm. Get it? I love you. Be back to talk with you beyond Medgar at a later date. Thank you for listening. Appreciate you. The words are great to go out to the sister Cola, Coley. Coley. Coley Cart. We love you madly and keep on producing and pushing. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs>